So we set the kids down and we explained, hey, guys, like, dad is transgender. And we explained what that means to be transgender. And uh, that must have been a, such a tough conversation. Um, it was because our, no, no, our son no, no, no. is autistic. And so okay. change is really hard for him. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, he was I heard, eight or nine at the time, it sounds like. I, I'm, yeah, about nine or 10. And, um, you know, the kids, it, they struggled at first, especially our son. Um, but I think, and we, we told them, look, we transition as a family or we don't transition at all. Um, everybody in our family had veto power. If you were not comfortable with it, just raise your hand and I will find a way to push through. Hello and welcome to Growing Up Christian. I'm Casey. And I'm Sam. And we were sitting here talking about it. We forgot to say thank you to everyone who pre-ordered t-shirts. We were really pumped to see those going out. Uh, They're in the process of being printed, but really appreciate everyone who jumped in there and got their uh, Born Again Virgin shirt. You're going to look real good in them. Oh yeah, dude! I it we were supposed to ship them out. Every of course, everything gets delayed. But we, there was, I think the listing said they would ship end of February. It's the end of February, and we don't have them in our hands yet to physically ship. So uh, I'm thinking we should be getting them sometime at the beginning of March. So they'll probably ship more like mid March at this point. But they're on their way. We even ordered. We did order a few extras. Uh, so we'll drop those. I actually think there's still a link. Yeah, I, I never took the link down to them. Uh, so you actually can still can still order it, but I should probably update quantities before that causes a problem. <laughs> yeah, probably so. So uh, April, you know, she has like a print store that she opens up periodically. And it's like some of her cosplay photos, you know, like nice photos that we've done. And oh, yeah. she sells copies the nfts them. is she in the nft game now oh no they're fungible they're they're being funged like over and over <laughs> again <laughs> it's it's funny because uh you know people like to send her requests for like what they sh- they they want her to write a message on the on the print to them but oh. they'll like send in like a specific message that they want written on, <laughs> which doesn't make so any dumb. sense to me. Isn't it supposed to be like, oh, they recognized you and wrote you a heartfelt note? Not like, hey, write these words on there to me so that they're on there and covering the picture. Thank you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you came with examples. Oh, man. Well, there's one. There's one guy that's ordered a a few of them lately and he wants a specific thing on each print and and he'll ask her to sign them like slightly different like his i think his name's drew and so he asked her on one to sign it to to drucifer okay (laughs) it hurts it's like so painfully lame it hurts is that uh uh supposed to be like lucifer or like I, I a christopher but just drew i think it's supposed to be lucifer like okay he's like All right, i'm i'm a little naughty a little oh, naughty I'm sure put a little lipstick print on there and sign it to drucifer hugs and kisses xo oh my god <laughs> i feel like the messages would get really specific uh like when they're requested like uh, please say that, wow, you are incredibly handsome. It was so nice meeting you. You have a perfect body, rock hard abs and pecs. And it's just some like lonely guy who's living in his parents' basement that doesn't quite look like that description, but feels really good about himself when he reads it. And just it, it adds to his fantasy land that he, he lives in. Yeah. Uh, okay. Message says, I would leave my husband for you, Drucifer. XO April. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely part of the fantasy. Yeah. So, you should start. Um, I'm surprised they're not asking you yet. You should get in on this. I think if you, if you joined in and you're like, look, I will write messages to you, long messages about how I'm coming after you because you stole my wife as some like handsome devilish fiend. And that might help too. I bet people would pay you for those messages. Yeah. It takes the, the RP a little bit deeper. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, they're creating <laughs> an entire world to live in. The real world sucks. Let them have it, dude. But for this no less than a hundred yeah. bucks a pop. Soon. Soon I'll just be like, I'll just be acting as people's metaverse girlfriend. Yeah. You know, going on dates and being cute and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's for. The when when the metaverse turns in into like turns into one big orgy, that's when we know we've <laughs> achieved greatness. Did you ever play Second Life? No. So I had a comms class at at Liberty, actually. And what, I don't remember what the, the reasoning was, but the guy had talked about this game, Second Life, which was like a early like Sims, internet. Right? No. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but it's it's people from all over the place. You know, it's a it's an online multiplayer deal. Yes. And it was not good. They they had us go in and set up an account and like try it out. Oh, think, really? Just basically for the reasoning that like, hey, this is going to be big someday. People are going to do this for fun and they're going to, you know, spend a lot of time in these online landscapes or whatever. But I remember was, this being talked about in some of the Christian magazines that I got or that my parents got when I lived at home. People had a problem well, with it, right? There's like a danger to it. People, they're not satisfied with this life because they don't know Jesus and Jesus brings satisfaction. Yeah. Oh, looking everywhere. They look far and wide for, uh, some people, for purpose and meaning, but it some can't people be found even have, outside of Christ. No, it can't. It, some people even have <laughs> girlfriends on this game in pretend life. I, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's very disturbing for them, I think. But uh, Second Life was weird because it was kind of just like an open world landscape and people... I don't remember. I would think that you probably had to pay to do certain things in the game, like build a house and stuff like that. But metaverse, dude, everyone acting like the metaverse just showed up. Bitch, Second Life been doing this since 2013. <laughs> yeah, oh, that it was an early it launched one. in June 2003 and saw rapid growth uh, for years. And in 2013, it had approximately one million regular users. I'm on Wikipedia. I would imagine I was on there in like 2008. Okay. But um, there was some adult spaces on Second Life. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What did like, you even do in them? I imagine the 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 way the characters worked, there wasn't a lot you could do. Just chat rooms and shit? Well, it's not great graphics. That's for sure. Very polygonal. But you basically like... You know, and like if you're playing Fallout or Skyrim or something, like if, you know, there'll be like a bench with a guitar on it. And it'll be like, play guitar. And so you click it and your character just kind of sits down automated and plays the guitar and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was like that, but it was like uh, sex positions and stuff like that. Oh, that was built into the game, huh? Yeah, yeah. Wow, edgy. You said not great graphics. It wasn't very uh, exciting, but it was there. Well, it's like with uh, GTA. You remember play? Did you ever play Grand Theft Auto back when you weren't supposed to? No, I don't think I ever really played Grand Theft Auto before. I had a friend whose house that my brother and I would go to, and that's where we that's where we would try anything. That makes it sound worse than it was. Uh, That's where we would play video (laughs) games we weren't supposed to and watch movies that we weren't supposed to. You know, he had he had Cinemax. So that was definitely where I saw my first soft core porn on like Cinemax at 1 a.m. or some shit like that and surrounded by your friends yeah no probably alone i think i was still too ashamed to admit that i had, would do that but there was like i, I would go down <laughs> to the base like the, all of the video game setup was in the basement and the, you know everyone went to bed i was like 
I went downstairs to turn it on. I remember feeling very dirty, like a big giant sinner. And uh, I was racked and plagued by guilt for, for a good, probably at least 36 hours afterwards before, you know, <laughs> you're horny again and you forget Oof. all about it. Yeah. Came, came close <laughs> to confessing. Perilous, it's a perilous. Thir- yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and you think you played out in your head. You're like, I'm in the get picked up the next morning after the sleepover the next afternoon you're driving home sitting in the front seat and you're what would happen if i said what i did last night right now and you <laughs> no matter which way you play that scenario it is not it's not playing out good uh you'll never be able to go over there again uh so you know i never said anything to this day my parents still don't know don't tell them casey okay well it's our our little secret Okay. Anyway, GTA though. Let me get back to GTA because uh, I don't remember if it was Grand Theft Auto one or two or something like that, but it was one of the early on ones, and you could go to a strip club. I don't. And okay, I forget what the name of it was, but I feel like I should remember it because that was a you know eventful moment in my life. I'm sure, but I remember you go to it, and there's a bunch of strip bunch of strippers. It's all like topless, and the graphics are. Very bad, but it's what it's funny because when you when graphics were bad but they were new, they you, your brain didn't perceive them as bad. It's like when you go back and like play right. Star Fox for Nintendo 64 or some shit, you're like, Oh my god, how did I even play this? Now you can't even <laughs> it looks like Pong. <laughs> remember when you when like like when um full HD TVs started coming out and stuff, like and you would try to hook up. I remember playing like trying to play a game for my GameCube on a TV that's picture quality was too good and you, it was unplayable. Like you could see all the pixel. It was so bad that you, you almost needed a, a worse TV to play it in a way that made it look okay. But anyway, GTA, <laughs> you would go into that strip club and you'd be like, Oh, that's so funny. You'd laugh out with your friends, but you're kind of just like, this is also kind of my first time seeing boobs that look better than the ones I hand drew last week. So <laughs> 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 the 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 women have like uh straw legs and then like paddle hands and they just kind of like <laughs> wave like just <laughs> like those, uh, and wave their their stiff arms what are the uh the those inflatables the outside of like car dealerships the <laughs> wavy <laughs> arm inflatable things <laughs> yeah wacky waving inflatable arm tube man yeah <laughs> Oh my god! Very exciting. So, uh, since we talked last week, this has been a weird week. It's a good week to uh, jump into the metaverse and just stay there. I feel yeah, like. I know. <laughs> it's the only world that's going to exist soon. Yeah. So Russia invaded Ukraine, and which team are you? All are kind you, of. Which are you, Team Putin or? Well, I think Putin's an admirable fella. Is you that- know. A solid uh, he's a leader. Christian man, mm. and you know he puts family and country first, which I can respect. You know I can't condone, can't condone the war, <laughs> but I can understand it. Let's say it that way. Hats off to you, Mister Putin. I hear you. No, uh, it, it's terrible, and I think it was. I mean, I felt like it was pretty unexpected. You know, like our government kind of sounded the alarms on it uh, in the weeks before that. But I feel like at this point, it's it's kind of hard to take it seriously when they're like pushing for some sort of armed or something that will sell missiles. It's hard to take what they're what they're saying seriously. Yeah, I don't do. I don't. So what's I, I, I don't feel like i have my finger on this too good so like any good podcaster i'm going to talk about something that i know nothing about and i think that i i know he's he he had recently come out and like yeah hey anyone who tries to stay in the way is going to get a nuke right up their asshole and that's That's a direct quote (laughs) it is that's what's so (laughs) wild about living in this world though is like everyone amassed nukes who could right and you get one, you have two, you have three. Like, like, okay, I'm sure tons of ink has been spilled about, you talk about our defense budget in the U.S. and how much of that was stockpiling nukes and how many we have. I got to a point where you're like, oh, 
we spent a lot of money on these. Maybe we should dismantle some and at least get like partial credit. But it's like it doesn't take a lot of nukes to destroy the the whole planet. And you're like, so we have a bunch, they have a bunch, and now everyone has them. And where does this go? Like, at least back when we, I don't, well, I don't want to say at least back when we fought World War II, but like, I, with World War II, it's like Hitler's just like, hey, you know what? I'll take that and then see what happens, right? No one says anything. No one does a lot about it. Let's try this again. Let's just keep this going. Why not? It's we no, I mean, has it? I'm I'm sure there's been a lot of conflict that doesn't get any sort of media publicity in our in our world, but I don't know, man. This feels like particularly strange in the way that he's just going in and saying, "This is mine now." This is, like people don't take land like that from people anymore, and to see that happen with I, the recourse, I don't really understand what I know. People talk about crazy ass sanctions to effectively shut down their economy uh, i don't know enough about what their imports and exports are to know how much that's going to affect them uh, but I, it's also it's clear that putin doesn't care if his people live or die so he'll he'll make some bold moves and you know he's not really he, he'll suffer the least and you know the lower <sighs> class will suffer the most like i don't think he's that concerned about about his people i think well it's it's a weird deal because there's so much stuff that led up to this like it kind of i don't know it's it's easy to look at it as something that happened overnight with no warning but um you know we've been kind of waging proxy war with russia throughout that like Eastern Europe region for a long time. And, you know, part of what, uh, part of what their, their motivation is, is, you know, they don't want Ukraine to become a, a NATO country. Yep. Join NATO. And I think there's, there's a few different reasons for that. I mean, one is right. It's right on their border, you know, which you think about like the Cuban missile crisis, the lengths that we went to keep, you know, weapons out of this tiny little country that's that's close to our borders. I mean, I don't think that's an unreasonable uh, concern for them to have NATO right on their doorstep. They also have like a lot of like their their oil pipelines and things like that that supply parts of Europe and things. A lot of that runs through Ukraine. So I'm sure they're concerned about the integrity of those pipelines and what could happen if they weren't under their control or something like that. There's also like the, the revolution that happened in Ukraine in, in 2014 is a weird event. And there was a lot of U S involvement in different ways. Um, you know, like, I don't know all the details of all this stuff. I'm not someone to, to, to quote on this stuff, but, we played a role in some of the stuff that happened there in 2014, which, you know, brought Ukraine as a country a little closer to the Western powers than they were before. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on, none of which justifies armed conflict. You know, I mean, th this is a crazy reaction to some of the concerns they're having. That said, I mean, you know, it's weird to look at this and think, God, is this what the rest of the world thought when we were invading Iraq? Yeah. Yeah. It does make you wonder if that's the way that it was looked at. That's an interesting parallel. It'd be understandable to look at it, though. I mean, it. I feel like there was even less reasoning for us to invade Iraq. I mean, it wasn't on our border. It wasn't really connected to terror in the way it, it was said to be. I mean, Matt, with the whole weapons of mass destruction pitch is, is a lot of why we ended up justifying, right. You know, invading and it all turned out to be a joke, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. Just, I, I, I don't know. It's a similar venture. It feels like Putin is such a, I don't know. This feels kind of send a messagey. Uh, I don't want to say a lot about this because again, I don't, I don't know a lot and I'm not that smart when it comes to foreign policies and things like that, but it's clear that he has a very like, I mean, he's a bit of a megalomaniac. I don't think that's 
very disputed. Uh, I don't entirely, I understand the risks of them joining NATO. I, I'm not entirely sure where that was at. Uh, was it like, were they about to sign the deal? Was it just an, an option? I thought no, maybe they, they had they actually want to. They weren't actually going to do that. I mean, so we basically refused to say that we wouldn't allow Ukraine to join NATO, but nobody really wanted them in NATO. So it doesn't it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I don't know why we couldn't give him that reassurance that like, hey, no, we're you know, it's it's on your border. We get that. We're not going to allow U- Ukraine to to join ever. I yeah, mean, that's a strong like, statement. There's ramifications to that too, but it, but it feels like from his ang- from Putin's angle, it's just like this was part of Russia. This is we want. I mean, it, it's just power. We want it back. Simple as that. Like, it's kind of send a message, right? Like, what do you want? People just uh, arranging a coup and doing their own thing after that? Like, I don't. It just seems like he's like, yeah, that's sorry, that that shit's not going to fucking fly here, guys. It feels more like just a power move uh, and power move fits his seems to fit his MO. And then he's just like, yeah, if anyone tries to stop this, uh, fuck you, too. And he's just going to I don't know how credible that threat is. I can't imagine him just pushing a button and launching a nuke on somebody because they tried to intervene. But I I think he's really getting a good idea of uh, how much people really are pri- prioritizing um, how much their their care for for the Ukraine. Like you put a strong message out like that. People are like, all right, let's wait. Oh, well, let's weigh our options here. Uh, what, what do we have to gain? What do we have to lose? And I don't know that they're not like a big enough national player for anyone to like to get involved militarily at this point. It seems I'm, I don't really know what the say again. I know people are calling for dire sanctions. I don't know if there'd be excluding from the world markets whatever i'm not sure what his reaction to that would be this is just going to be a ultimately it's just it would be um, tough all i've done is speculate but this is just going to be a wild fucking thing to watch play out they they really don't have the economy to i mean they they are not going to exist self-sufficient outside of like western markets and stuff like that i mean that's going to be very tough on the people on the ground Um, yeah yeah it is it is a big part of it is sending a message. I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, Putin's long term goals of of reestablishing some Soviet bloc yeah, yeah. border lines and stuff, which I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that's if that's a part of what he wants to do. I don't know how big of a motivation that is in the whole thing, but it's I don't know. It's weird, man. And the whole thing is strange, especially I mean, we haven't been alive that long, you know, what, 30, 35 years? Yeah, just not, about not too long. And we've seen governments pitch military intervention quite a few times at this point. It, I don't know. It's it's strange to me, the 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 way that it's being discussed and the I don't know the way that people are talking about it. Like, I think it's in some ways they are probably it's probably good that we're such a war weary country at this point because it at least provides some, some resistance to the notion that like we should just charge over there with all of our, <laughs> yeah. all of our guns. But uh, I don't know. The Christian reaction to it has been really weird. Yeah. Super it's- fucking weird. So before we even jump to that, like, so my brother had when that when we were in high school had done a missions trip to russia my brother was very interested in he he started taking russia in high school he was very interested in russia uh their history their culture whatever it just he was very interested in it and i remember it coming up a couple of times maybe from my dad i don't know if i'm remembering it correctly but the conversation had come up a couple of times so like kind of curious as to why he was so interested in it. It's like Putin's a, like a bad dude. Um, and they're communist dictatorship, uh, or dictatorship. Are they communist? 
All right, can you be a dictatorship and not be communist? What do I know about anything? All I know is socialism. <laughs> it's communism. There are a lot of questions. Get the fuck out. If you're communist, you're socialist. If you're socialist, you're Bernie Sanders. If you're Bernie Sanders, you don't beat Donald Trump. Bernie Sanders is Putin. Yeah, Bernie Sanders is Putin. <laughs> they both wear mittens. They both sit and fold out lawn chairs. Uh, anyway, my brother is yeah so that conversation had come up like uh, russia's kind of like a you know, you sure i don't know what's your interest in that like are you gonna become an expat you, you're not very patriotic <laughs> what's going on here but whatever so i but i remember that concern coming up like people oh oh russia people that's pretty wild over there what putin's doing some shit right it, it came up a good bit uh so my only point is that that was probably almost 20 years ago so there was there was still a level of like red scare resistance to the idea of like doing anything with Russia like that was yeah. still an imprinted on on their minds at the time. Yep. And fast forward to 2022 and people don't necessarily seem to feel the same way about Russia that they did uh, not only 20 years ago but 10 or 6 years ago. Uh, right around the time that Donald Trump <laughs> got peed on by some prostitutes over there is about the same time that people were like, hmm, maybe it's not so bad over in Russia, eh? And that was the Canadians, by the way. <laughs> Hence the A. I don't know. Yeah, I, I saw some, uh, <laughs> Sorry, some Luke Wilson. strange, like, what is it? Christian Nightmares posted some people like, oh, there was like a America First conference that uh, he played some clips from and it was like, uh, I th it might've been Tommy Lauren. She was oh, saying God. like, She's just you know, Putin's a, a, you know, God and country, you know, Russia first sort of candidate. And I can respect that. And I actually have more in, in common with that value set than I do with a lot of the people in this country. Oh like, my God. Oh my God. Shut up. And Tucker Carlson had his cool things to say about it. Like, I don't know, something about supporting Putin. He walked that back. Like, it was like up until Putin invaded, he was like, I mean, who are we to say? What am I to do? I don't know. I just say dumb shit and look at the camera with a smug, wrinkly fucking pug face. And the next day, <laughs> he's like, I don't, I don't, I know he was just trying to walk it back. It was just, well, well, that's not what I meant, kind of deal. But I, I don't even know if he meant, he's an idiot because I don't know if he ever means what he says. He just says what gets reactions. That's his kind of, that's his deal. Yeah, it definitely feels that way. It's just like, oh, how can I naysay this? And until he like borders on domestic terrorism or he's just like, that's, that's his line. Or apparently now this is his line too. Uh, one country invading another and acting like it doesn't really matter that much to us. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a lot of really stupid takes on the whole thing. It's like anytime somebody starts talking about Putin in, in good terms, you're like, yeah, you know, he's a man's man. He puts Russia first. You know, he seems to have a respect for like traditional values, blah, blah, blah. Like he poisons a lot of journalists. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Idiot. just the bad ones, just the ones that are saying lies about him. Look, yeah, I wouldn't False, do it that Fake way. news. He I don't clamps agree down with on that. fake news. Exactly. But how are you supposed to, how are you going to gut fake news, man, without taking a hard stance on it? Like, you know, <laughs> maybe he's not so bad. Which journalist are you poisoning first? Uh, here in this country? Yeah. Who you got? Tucker Carlson. I'll go for him. Look, it's, I know he's a Putin sympathizer. And if you really want to get a fascist regime going, you don't start with, you know, you cozy up to that side and you start poisoning the left. I get it. Uh, but that's not my move. I want to see, like, I call me bold. I want to see if we can make leftist ideas work with a fascist empire. And I want to be just close enough to the top where I, I get to have a major say in who we poison and how things play. Out. That's my, <laughs> that's where I'm coming from. I think it's an, the American experiment, I think, failed, but it's time for a new one. Leftist policies, liberal ideology, under fascist dictatorship, run by the people who know better than everybody else, Casey. 
It sounds like you're saying the United States of California. Oh, somebody, <laughs> somebody call up Jesse Ventura. No, is that who it is? Was he? No, he's from Minnesota. Ah, Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's why he sounds like he's about to stuff a pasty down his face. Ooh. Arnie can help us out. Right there. There you go. Wrong wrestler. Yeah, wrong one. No, Arnold wasn't even a wrestler, but. This we are wading in deep waters and Look, without a sometimes snorkel. we talk about things we don't know much about. <laughs> Sports is a horrible direction for us to go in, as we found out last week uh, when we had uh Walker Glenn on, we got into sports pretty quick and that was, a, that was bad. That didn't go great. And, uh, wrestling turns out wrestling and, uh, California governors are other topics we need to avoid in the future. So, um, it didn't, it wasn't planned, but it just sort of worked out that we had a guest on this for this week's episode that does have an informed stance on some of the things that we're talking about for just war in general and the toll that it takes. Um, our guest this week is Natalie drew. Uh, Natalie is a transgender woman and a, and a U S army veteran that served in Iraq. And, uh, there's a lot in this episode. I don't know how to say it any other way. I mean, there's just a lot. Yeah, you know, we we start out and we talk a lot about like uh, her her journey as a transgender woman and and everything that went along with that, and then transition into a broader discussion about war and the toll that it takes on the people on the ground. And it's uh, it's it's shocking at times. I mean, it's it's a really uh, powerful statement from somebody who who lived that that experience and and who has to deal with the the ramifications of it. And I think given what's going on in the world right now, I feel like it's it's pretty important to hear the perspective of somebody like Natalie and uh and what she went through. Um you know, all all the support in the world to the people of Ukraine and and those who are who are protecting their their country and their family and stuff like that. I think we we have to be careful to to not lose sight of the fact that like peace is the best possible outcome. Yeah. Dude, I honestly talking to now I when we had first reached out, I was like we've we've heard a lot of different perspectives uh since starting this. Uh and we've talked to you know a lot of people have gone through gay conversion therapy or have had varying experiences as being part of the LGBTQ community. And I was interested in having a conversation with her because we haven't talked to somebody as a trans, who's a, a trans person and a Christian and, and how that has affected their life and what that's looked like and, and the challenges that have come with that. And, so for us to get into her her experiences um, as you know as a veteran, and I was just blown away by it. It, went, it took a different it took a different direction than I had expected, and it, it to hear her perspective on what it was like to be involved in I, was it I I'm already slipping away. It was Afghanistan, I think, is where she was, um, but. To hear that and then to hear how she internalized her experiences as a way to become a, a more caring and empathetic person, to want to bridge gaps, um, build bridges, was very impactful. I mean, I it's, I haven't stopped considering the conversation we had with her since we heard it. I learned a lot. Um, and, and it was, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know. I'm just really excited for other people to hear. I've been waiting. We've been waiting to put this out for a little while. And it's we're, we're excited that everyone gets to to finally hear it and hear from such a, just a really awesome person. Yeah. So without any further ado, uh, enjoy our conversation with Natalie Drew. Hey everyone. We're back with our guest, Natalie Drew. Natalie, thanks so much for hanging out with us. Oh, thank you for uh, inviting me on. Yeah. I'm super excited to get into your story. It sounds like 
Uh, it's very multifaceted. But why don't you go ahead and just kick us off with like a 30,000 foot view of, um, you know, the kind of upbringing you had and just kind of who you are. Just give us a little snapshot about who you are. Okay. So um, born and or yeah, born and raised in the what they call the independent fundamental Baptist world. Um, you had fundamental in your name. In yes. Your and name they well. wear that title with um as a badge of honor um if you if anybody's heard of uh jack hiles um we wouldn't go to bob jones university because bob jones university was a liberal that's where the liberal heathen (laughs) so that kind of gives you an idea of where we were and um (laughs) you know so i i was kind of born in that world where um you know all the great ifb i say great use that term very loosely, uh, preachers, the Bob Grays, the Jack Hiles. Um, I sat under all of them and, um, it's a very abusive world, um, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And so that's kind of the world I was brought up in around five or six years old was when I started, you know, I, I'm 42 years old. So when I was five or six, I'm, we're talking like the mid 1980s. Mm-hmm. So even in the greater 1980s culture, you didn't really have terms for, you know, the terms like transgender or gender identity or gender dysphoria were not part of our uh, normal vocabulary. Right. But especially within the IFB um, cult is, and it really is a cult. Um, so, Around five or six is when I really started struggling, not knowing the words to put to it, but knowing I wasn't like the boys in my class. And Hmm. so, um, but I also didn't have any place to go with that. I didn't, didn't know what I was feeling, didn't. And so um, I just kind of trudged through and, you know, I became like a lot of um, trans kids, you know, who have to kind of repress that. I became very violent. Um, very, I guess, into things that would show that I'm a boy. <clears throat> and so um, sports, fighting, I think in fifth grade, I counted around 45 to 50 different fights that I got into. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it, it kind of growing up in that world, uh, you know, I grew up in a pilot's family. So we kind of moved all over um, East Texas, um, spent most of my childhood um, up in Southern Indiana. That's where we kind of got exposed to the Jack Hiles uh, strain of the IFB world. And, um, you know, I remember during that time, especially as I was um, kind of going through puberty, I remember, you know, it was a nightly prayer for me, you know, they, you know, cause my faith has always been very important to me. And, um, I remember praying, especially when you're in a very fear driven, uh, religious world, um, begging God, like, God, I, I believe that you're a God of miracles. Um, you know, so just give me this one, like get, let me wake up in the morning being who I am. Let me wake up in the morning. I can be a girl. Um, and you can make it to where nobody, um, would know the difference, like change their memories. Um, I was like, but if you don't, please, um, just kill me. Like it was a nightly prayer. Um, it was just, you know, and tears soaked and going through that as a teenager and not having anywhere to turn. Um, you know, I want to jump in for a second because, you know, you talked about the that not having like a language or were you f- not really being familiar with these? What by the time you started going through puberty, did you feel like, did you, were you aware of like the, the terms? Were you aware that of that there were transgender people? Um, um, no, not really. I okay. like now around that time, that's when, you know, I, you know, again, I'm really going to date myself. It's also at the time that you saw the rise of, personal computers at home and the internet. And mm-hmm. I remember getting onto the dial up modem to log on to prodigy. Um, and, you know, so I started kind of discovering some of this, but I really didn't know what to make of it. Um, so 
So outside of any cultural context for it, it's just like that was just an innate feeling that you knew you had, which is, is important, I think, to talk about because uh, there's definitely now with it being very much in the, the zeitgeist of you know our time, our com- cultural conversation, uh, I think it's easy for parents uh, who aren't affirming to to feel like, oh, this is just something you're picking up at school or something like that. So for you to be able to recognize that, uh, for what it was at that time is, I think, important to, for people to hear. Absolutely. And that's a point I make a lot uh, with people is, you know, they say, oh, you're you're trying to trans kids. I'm like, I didn't have any, in, like, I could not have been more removed from that world than I was when I grew up. And I knew deep down that this is who I was. So, um I start probably about 15. I really threw myself into proving how much of a guy that I am. Um, you know, the fighting, of course, um, uh, sports. You know, I, I, I became very, very angry. <clears throat> you like the Kimbo slice of the IFB. Yeah, <laughs> basically, yes. And um you know, I, that's kind of what I was known for. I was a very angry person and, um, you know, I went off to college and that's where I really started. Um, I guess when you grow up in a bubble, uh, and you, I, I went to Texas A&M at the time, um, it was about 40 to 45,000 students. Now it's around 70 to 75,000 students. But you go into this massive ocean of diversity. And and I say that kind of, if anybody's from Texas, A&M's never had the reputation of being a diverse university. Um, a lot of people that looked like me, at least when it came to skin color and, you know, but it was still, I remember seeing the first time I saw on Ash Wednesday, um, people walking around with the ashes on their forehead. I had zero clue what that was about. I, huh. Because yeah. Catholics were evil in the the way I was brought up. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so, you know, I went to, I remember at A&M that, um, you know, things like I played in a city league softball uh, league on a city league softball team with my uh, friends. Um, I got suspended from that by the city um, for a very angry outburst. Um, you know, every there was always just this like wrath, I guess, just bubbling beneath the surface. <clears throat> and so um, I had to go to anger management. Um, you know, I dealt, uh, got in fights at, uh, at A&M. Um, you know, a lot of self, my college years was full of like a lot of self-hatred and internalized homophobia. Um, you know, I remember my youth minister from, uh, we moved back down to Texas, my, my junior year of high school and, um, moved to the Austin area. Our youth minister, um, was accused of uh, sexually molesting a young, uh, um, guy in our, uh, youth group. Uh, And, and, you know, we all knew the kid was gay. I mean, it was just, you know, um, that wasn't the, you know, we, we knew he was gay, but I, I had it in my mind that, you know, instead of holding that youth minister accountable, um, I remember when he was convicted, uh, and rightfully so, but when he was convicted, um, I wanted to lash out um, at there was a gay bar in Bryan College Station. Um, I actually had a gun ready, um, you know, and I kind of oh, talk yeah. about. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with Bridget Eileen Rivera. I don't no. think so. Well, she just wrote a book, um, "Heavy Burdens: um, Seven Ways the Church Harms LGBTQ Christians." Um, and you know, her and I talked. Uh, for the book. And I kind of shared this story in there. It's not my, obviously not my proudest story. A lot of that internalized uh, Mm self-hatred. And um, fortunately I didn't do anything, but you know, so I knew that the path that I was on was unsustainable. Um, I was either going to end up in jail or end up dead, but I wasn't ready. Um, And I would, 
I would kind of do things in secret. I would try to explore who I was in secret, but that culture of shame that I was brought up in um, sure. amplified the self-hatred and it became this vicious cycle. So I chose, I found a way to where I could prove how manly I was. I could be violent and I could do it all with the blessing of our greater culture. And I enlisted in the army. And so I, um, uh, you know, my wife and I, we met while we were students there and it's when I, we met and I was already planning on going into the military at the time. So that was kind of like a, um, a huge moment for me. I'm like, okay, not only can I cure this gender dysphoria and still not even knowing the term gender dysphoria, but I could cure it by doing the most manly thing in the world. I enlisted to go special forces. Um, wow. And did and, you, were you, were you, are you, I can't, I just want to gauge it right. Were you actually hoping and thinking that this could cure you or was this just kind of, <laughs> were you, did you feel like you were suppressing it? I'm wondering. Um, how it, I how thought it that I honestly believe that it could fix me. Um, that getting married, having kids, going into the army, doing the manly things could finally get these thoughts out of my head. And Just a fairly, that seems fairly common. I mean, whether, whether whatever, wherever you're at um, as an LGBTQ person, if you're, you know, if you're gay, you might move into the more masculine things, whatever. I mean, you see that all the time and then trying to force themselves like that into a, a hole that they don't fit in. You know, and I, re I don't remember uh, the source of this where I read this. I think it was after there was a very notable case of a special forces <clears throat> special forces soldier who came out as transgender and the special forces community has a higher rate of trans people who come out as trans than the general population. Um, really? And it really makes sense if you think about it, because there's kind of this phenomenon amongst trans women called the flight to hypermasculinity. Okay. We, we we try to become overly masculine to kind of beat this out of us to kind of if we can just push it all the way down into this deep dark closet um then maybe we can function in life but that doesn't work and so i joined the army uh fractured a vertebrae when i was in basic training and so i i ended up not going special forces so that just kind of defaulted me to be um, infantry. So I spent six years as a, uh, infantry soldier, um, was medically retired in 2010 after back surgery. I was an airborne soldier. Uh, it's just the wear and tear. And so, yeah. uh, you know, so, uh, my last couple of years in the army though, I don't really recall that much. Um, I was heavily addicted to pain pills. Um, mm. I think at one point they had me on the strongest Percocet, muscle relaxers, nerve medication, sleep medication, um, and then three oh, antidepressants. Wow. And so, Jesus Christ, that's your like <laughs> army prescribed. Yeah, is and I would take them. I would take them when I went to my unit in the morning, and because by this time, um, I'm, the term that we use in the army for people like me, where my back was just completely done, I wasn't doing anything. We call we call them broke dicks, and um, I was, you know, so I was working in what they call the training room. I would take my pills in the morning, and I would just pass out. Like I would literally be sitting in a chair, drool coming out. So the army, my unit said, just go home, call us once a week to let us know you're alive. So um, that was when the addiction really took hold because I'm just sitting at home with yeah alone. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's awful for and someone so, struggling with addiction. Uh, it got to like this breaking point where I remember we're sitting in our house in Phoenix city, Alabama, and I'm laying in the bathtub. Uh, I've got a loaded pistol in my right hand and I'm slamming my head up against the wall <clears throat> behind me. And my wife comes in and she's like, that's it. We're done. Like not we're done as in our marriage, but we're done with this. And so she took all my pills and she threw them away. And so, um, but then that led the army to figure out because I, 
mom was a, a nurse. So she was like, you can't just quit that many pills cold turkey. You can, it can lead to renal failure. So you need to go to the hospital. And so my unit found out. So long story short, uh, medically retired. And then uh, when I got out, I didn't really know what to do. But I got a call for a job in Houston, Texas uh, for HR generalist position. Just out of I, the blue? I was, Is that yeah. something the Army kind of helps people transition out of? or? Um, no, I had uh, my last couple of years, somehow um, I got my MBA uh, during that period where I was like heavily medicated. And so um, I had my resume out there and I found out after I got the job that um, they just... The HR department I was hired into was kind of badly organized. Great HR people, but organization wasn't their skill set. So they wanted, my boss wanted to hire somebody with a military background. That was his only criteria. And so I just kind of stumbled into HR and um, fell in love with it. And so about, that was about 2010. Uh, about 2012, we happened to move across the street to uh, from a Church of Christ, which my wife was born and raised Church of Christ. And so like by that point, the last 10 years, I could probably count on one hand the number of times I went to church. Uh, I, I just, you know, when you go to the churches I grew up in, then you move over to the Southern Baptist world. Uh, I just never... You know, there was so much judgment and condemnation in the world that I grew up in. I just had no interest in it. And but we we knew that our parents would ask if we visited the church across the street. So we decided <laughs> to visit the church across the street just to say we had. And that one day changed our lives forever. Um, we Heather and I, Heather's my wife. We both grew up in the church. That was the first time we'd ever walked into a church and felt loved. Um, and so it really took hold for us. And I became really close with the pastor there. Uh, I still hadn't come out to anybody at that point about you know my gender identity. But I kind of through a lot of conversations with my pastor uh, or preaching minister, Church of Christ is weird about that. Um, but having these conversations, um, I started kind of growing more and more, I guess, radical. What you kind know, of so, conversations were you having? Uh, you know, Heather and I would lay in bed at night and we, we, we got really excited for our faith. And so we would okay. read and we would talk about these things and I would email our preach, you know, especially, you know, the red letters, you know, I'd email the, our, uh, preacher, Aaron, and I'm like, Hey, Aaron, am I crazy? Like I'm reading this and it seems like I don't see how we can justify any violence as like, you know, am I crazy? You know, am I crazy for reading this and saying, you know, uh, you know, like one thing, like first Samuel a, and you read, um, these different verses where the, the, they talk about government and I'm like, you know, and you, full disclosure, we're anarchists. Um, but, you know, we finally kind of got to that point where we're like, okay, I don't see any other way around it. And we really embraced an ethic of nonviolence and, and it kind of permeated everything about our lives. Um, not just kind of, you know, how I viewed violence in general, but it impacted our parenting. Um, we, uh, we embrace what's called peaceful parenting. Um, you know, we don't punish our kids. We talk with our kids because our kids are fully fun when you know they're functioning human beings and they can be reasoned with and they can be talked to. Yeah. Um, How old so, were your kids when you started going to this church? Uh, our son was probably um, seven or eight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's, um, a that's a big shift, you know, for the, for your family. Uh, yeah. It's like, and then for you to get excited about your faith, that so that you weren't parenting that way um, before that. So this, this hmm. is all this, uh, these conversations you're having were faith related conversations uh, with the, <laughs> the minister. And then as it started impacting your, your beliefs uh, it's affected your parenting. So that's, a, that's a lot going on there for your family with your son being seven and you're learning all these new things. Yeah. And so, um, so, you know, we, we kind of, you know, 
went along that path and you know that that's when i was able to find uh organizations like raw tools they take guns and turn them into garden tools Mm -hmm. um uh christian peacemaker teams i went over to um palestine for two weeks with christian peacemaker teams. oh nice a few years ago i was actually looking at that organization um as for a trip that was when i I was having my i don't know maybe your quarter life crisis you know you're you're like what what do i do what's what has meaning but uh, Um, and that's kind of like where i was i wanted to do something that had some meaning and so um you know but you know we we really started kind it started kind of permeating every aspect of our lives, but that's when about the same time, probably about 2015 is when the depression from the gender dysphoria really started hitting me hard. And, um, I had actually came out to a friend at work first. Uh, her name was Tara and we had went out, uh, to grab wine after work one day. And, uh, I told her, you know, like, Hey, I, I pretty sure I'm transgender. She was great. She encouraged me to tell my, you know, and she, she basically told me what I tell people who now approach me in that situation. We owe it to our spouses to be open and honest. And, uh, so I told Heather and, you know, I know early on, uh, you know, a lot of people on Twitter see kind of where Heather and I are now. Mm-hmm. That's not where we were at the beginning of this transition. I know when, um, and I, and I thank Heather for being like this. And sorry if my voice, like my right ear, is like all messed up right now. <clears throat> so I feel like I'm talking really weird. But um, so Heather was like her initial reaction was like, okay, but that's never going to happen. And um, she, so she's like, that's never going to happen. Um, you can do what you want and you're away from us, but I don't want to see it. I don't want the kids to see it. And that was probably more of a concession than I was expecting. Um, a lot of wives will just flat out leave you at that point. Sure. That's a, I mean, that's a bomb to drop on somebody, especially when, you know, you grew up in the church or that's yeah. not something that you're familiar with in any way. And now you're back in the church and you, whether or not you feel loved in that space, uh, I think in the back of everyone's mind knows uh, there's some kind of big no-nos that you don't even <laughs> really bother broaching. And that's definitely one of them. Maybe not necessarily in that community, uh, and we'll, as we'll hear soon, but um, I'm not sure. But that's generally the perception people have when they're in a faith community. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, so she she was great. And if you had given me the choice to go 100 miles an hour into my transition at that point, I absolutely would have, and I would have not been prepared for it. Um, hmm. I would have ran faster than I, my body was willing to or able to. So I appreciate the fact that she wasn't, uh, she wasn't where I was, but an even greater credit to her is she didn't just bottle it up and put it away. Uh, she started reading, she started growing, trying to understand the depression became worse and worse and worse. Uh, because it feels like once you, once you put that nugget out there, um, you feel like you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and you really want to, but when you can't make progress towards it, it tears you apart inside. So, um, you know, the, then it became, okay, uh, we'll go away. For the weekend, you know, we'll get a hotel and, you know, we can go out with you as yourself. And so we did that, but huh. it was how, how far after you, you came out to your wife, uh, did, uh, what was the space between that moment? And then when your wife kind of came around with this, um, this agreement? I want to say it was about six to nine months. Okay. And pretty fast. I mean, that, I'm sure it felt like forever with your depression and full swing, but I mean, that's a a huge credit to your, to your life to be able to dive into it and, and just make that concession. She, even if she wasn't like fully there to just to do it. I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. She, she, um, you know, I'm always, I always say that she, if, if grace is something, if, if grace is getting what we don't deserve, uh, 
then she's evidence of God's grace in my life. Cause I don't deserve somebody like her. Um, she's been my lifesaver on multiple occasions. And so, but the depression just, I mean, it became so oppressive. I would come home from work and I would just crawl in bed and cry until I go to sleep. And, uh, the kid still didn't know. Um, my family, the rest of my family, everybody just assumed, well, yeah, you deployed. This is all PTSD. Go to get therapy for PTSD. And um, so we finally told the kids, uh, I want to say it was 2017. So it had probably been a year and a half. Uh, Heather had agreed, okay, uh, try hormones because she's like, talk to a doctor. You know, we can at least have that conversation. Um, came back and said, like, you know, the doctor said the we won't start seeing permanent changes for a couple months if I start hormones. So we sat the kids down and we explained, hey, guys, like, dad is transgender. And we explained what that means to be transgender. And uh, that must have been such a tough conversation. Um, it was because our no, no, our no, son no, no, no. is autistic, and so okay. change is really hard for him. Sure, yeah. <laughs> and so you he know, was for, eight or nine at the time, it sounds like. I, I'm, yeah, right? I want to say. I want to say. Wait, yeah, about nine. Wait, he was born in two thousand six. Yeah, about nine or ten, and um, uh, you know, the kids it, they struggled at first, especially our son. Um, but I think, and we we told them, look, we transition as a family or we don't transition at all. Um, everybody in our family had veto power. If you were not comfortable with it, just raise your hand and I will find a way to push through. Um, but it finally got to the point where I kind of, I can say that I hit rock bottom because I remember the depression. Um, I sat with Heather. By this point, we didn't have any guns or anything like that. Um, but I was sitting with Heather and I said, we both know where this is going. We both know that I am eventually going to uh, die by suicide. But my fears were one, dying alone. And two, my family walking in on my body, just sitting there. Um, so I, I honestly and sincerely asked them, let me take, I can get a bottle of pills. Let me take the pills and y'all just sit with me as I slowly drift off. Wow. Um, and let, let me at least give me that. And that was kind of that final straw where it's like, okay, um, you know, go full force on the hormones. Um, you know, at the time, social transition still wasn't on the table. Um, I don't know if I... I kept telling myself, okay, all I all I need are the hormones and I'll be fine. Can, I want to ask a question about that because that, that's something I'm not familiar with. So the hor <laughs> without social transition being on the table, what were the the hormones were supposed to just were they what was what were those going to help with? Is can that, can you explain what social transition is? Because I um, I'm not familiar with that. Oh yes. Social transition is me living my life as Natalie Drew. Um, me, me presenting in accordance with my gender identity. Um, and you know, I've changed, I've changed my legal name. I've changed my, uh, gender markers, my birth certificate, all that stuff to me, like that is social transition where I walk out of my house, um, and people see a woman. Um, so I was on hormones for probably about two years before I got to that point. And the hormones did help significantly with the depression um, okay. because, um, you know, th there have been some very preliminary studies about brain structure with transgender people, especially transgender people who uh, uh, had early onset dysphoria, like as children. And what these early studies point to is, a you know, th what they found was... Um, this possible biological connection, the brain structure of a trans woman uh, more closely matched the brain structure of a cisgender woman than a cisgendered man. Interesting. And so I think getting those proper hormones in my body helped, you know, they, I 
do believe that they helped. Um, it was more than a placebo effect. Mm-hmm. Um, but eventually that became physically painful for me because, uh, you know, we trans, you never, it's like with the, going through regular puberty uh, or first puberty, uh, you never know kind of what the uh, uh, results are going to be. You know, some girls go through puberty, they grow in certain areas. Um, same with boys, you know, you have those different physical effects. Um, I remember saying breast growth was one thing I was not concerned about. Didn't care. Um, so naturally I developed a little bit more there and mm-hmm. hiding that is physically painful. Um, cause I would sure. have to basically bind. Um, and if you don't do it the right way, which I'm sure I wasn't, it can be, it can be bad for your health. And so, uh, I remember when I came out to my, uh, uh one of my coworkers um, at my last job, uh, her name was Victoria. And I told her, and it was, I, I'll never forget this. She told me, she is like, I was wondering because she is like, there are some, cause men at my last job had to wear a button up shirt. And she was like, there are some days I'm like, you know, and I, I'm never going to misgender myself in my memories. She was like, is she really working out her pecs a lot? Because, you know, I would, try to conceal them, but the shirt was a little bit tighter and it was really tight around the chest, but, um, it became physically painful. It became much more difficult to hide. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'd go play, uh, basketball at our church with, uh, a group of men and, you know, I was shaving my legs, uh, you know, having to wear a sports bra and trying to kind of hide that. And you go every time like, Oh, please don't do shirts and skins. Please. Yeah. I was just going to say, it probably would have made shirts and skins super awkward. <laughs> yeah. This, this will be an awkward time to come out. So, um, <laughs> so it finally got to the point where I told Heather, I was like, look, I, I've got to, you know, get this off my chest. I've got to come out. And so I came out to the uh, HR chain at my at with within my company they were nothing but supportive then about a month later i sent an email to all of our managers uh explain like saying hey this is who i am um and i still at that time didn't realize i i think even in that email i told them i don't know if i will ever social transition but i want you to know who i am well that was in mid-october and then on January 6th is my first was my first day to come into work as myself, uh, January 6th, 2020. And I will never forget that day because one, it's like my birthday. But two, um, I remember thinking 2020 is going to be the greatest year of all time. And uh, <laughs> guess what? <laughs> what? Three months later, we're in quarantine. So um <laughs> So, yeah, that's kind of, and, you know, from that point on, um, that's kind of, you know, just I live my life and I've become much more vocal, you know, obviously about being a trans woman. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's great because it's opened up a door for us. Heather and I, we have several couples. I think we've, we're kind of on our fifth couple that have reached out to us. Um, typically, the uh, trans spouse closeted trans spouse will reach out to me first and same struggles, you know, married in the church. What do I do? And so kind of working through that, you know, and I'll be like, look, Heather's more than willing to talk to your wife, uh, to try to walk through them, uh, hand in hand to kind of, because, uh, you know, I, I saw somewhere now, I don't know how accurate this is, but 50%, it's a 50, 50 chance of your marriage surviving a transition. Um, I'll be honest. That's higher than I would would even think. Yeah. I I was surprised. I'm like, Oh, 50, 50, not bad at all. (laughs) That's not what I was expecting. Um, but, uh, so now that's kind of where we are. We, we, Taught, we have Zoom calls with these couples trying to kind of walk them through this, whether or not they leave. It's, it's never to try to keep them within the faith. Um, it's to try to help them. You know, actually, it's not really with any goal in mind other than trying to help 
both people understand what's going on. Wow. So I want to ask you a little bit about what that, what, like, so you made, when you made that decision to, to go to work as your true self, uh, what, I don't know, I don't know if it's weird. Like, I don't know if it was like a setup, if you're like, Hey everyone, I'm coming into work this day and things are going to be different now. Or if it was just, you walk in, but what was that like? And then how nervous did you feel? Um, if nervous at all, I mean, maybe you felt like free. So, uh, you know, working in a higher ed environment, we had we're tied to the higher because I worked at Texas A and M, so we're tied to the academic calendar. So before we went for Christmas break, um, I by that point I had told everybody, hey, first day back coming this uh, spring semester, uh, I'm going to be Natalie, and. You know, so I'll be I'll be presenting, and I I don't even like that term. Um, I'll just be me. And mm-hmm. um, so came back our first day back because I'm an HR manager. Um, first days are typically like orientation, or that's when that first week is when we do stuff. Um, so because of the because of all the other stuff we had going on to get ready for the new semester. The very first day back, most of like all of our managers, their first time to see me was when I had to stand up in front of the all 60 managers and deliver an hour and a half long class twice. Um, <laughs> so that that was a little nerve wracking, but it made me feel better because one of our managers, uh, her name was Shanna, was a great or is a great friend of mine. Uh, she was late to the class. She came up to get the notebook. She told me afterwards that um, she was like, yeah, I walked in. She was like, oh, I guess corporate sent some woman. And then she got up to the front. She said, holy crap, that's Natalie. And so um, I was surrounded by uh, really great pe- friends. That's who, amazing. Um, you know, and I, I'm also, I also understand I had a position of privilege um, as the HR manager. I, I was confident nobody was going to give me a, a grief. You know, they, they weren't going to harass me because I'm the HR manager. Yeah, it's a little, like makes yeah. things complicated. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wasn't like, you know, you know, we, had, we would hire, say, a food service worker or a cashier um, who may be transgender. Um, they don't have the same protection that I had. They don't have the same position um, or leverage that I had. So I knew that there were people who, I mean, I know that there are people there who didn't like me, um, especially after I came out. Um, my boss at the time being one of them. But I also knew that they keep their mouth shut because I can make their life very uh, tough for them because uh you know, we, I worked for a major multinational corporation. The last thing they want is a news story about, you know, your transgender HR manager being harassed. Yeah. That doesn't look great. <laughs> was so during the, you know, the, it had to, uh, given the, the way that, you know, this, your social transition went, like it had to feel like kind of a, like a start point. You know, with because it was, you know, like that event at the beginning where you give this big presentation and stuff that that was so public facing. Was there like any particular aspect of of that time period, like that public facing transition and stuff that was extra significant to you that you were like, finally, I get to you know dress a certain way or, or anything like yeah. that? You know, uh <sighs> One of the little things that really stuck out to me was the the course I was giving was actually on how to communicate with respect. Um, but putting that presentation together, you know, that first slide is like, you know, you got the title, the date, and you got your name on the front. <clears throat> the first time I used my name, like in this presentation, just seeing it there, looking at the screen and seeing Natalie Drew. Um, that was something that hit me a lot. Um, I really, um, you know, it's kind of like, okay, this is happening. And, um, so that's probably one of those little moments that really stuck out to me. Um, you know, part of the, I guess, issue is, um, that first, 
you know, I came out and I showed up to work as my, I felt gypped. I felt like I kind of got screwed out of my first year um, because three months into my social transition, uh, everybody gets furloughed and we go into quarantine and I don't, you know, so I had to kind of not put everything on hold, but I just couldn't, you know, I just, you know, I kind of buried myself at home and, um, you know, so, but that really that first presentation that putting my name out there. Um, that was, that was probably the most profound part of it for me. Um, you know, I knew I had enough support at work, um, that I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't worried about how people reacted. I knew the people who would have an issue with it. Um, but even before I came out, I didn't like those people and they didn't like me. So it was, it's like no skin. off. <laughs> and so, um, but just, yeah, the little things of like doing that presentation and being myself. And even now, uh, yeah, I still wear, I still have the outfit that I wore and I wear it every now and then. And it just kind of sticks out to me. Um, I, whenever I wear those clothes, I remember, like, hey, oh yeah, this is my first outfit. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of, but really that doing that first presentation, the little things of like seeing my name on the screen um meant a lot to me yeah can can we talk about your choosing of your name and and how you kind of started thinking about that settled on it i think that's such an interesting concept because obviously I, that's not something most people get to do or if anything like you know what so when i got married because i'm a filthy patriarch my wife changed her <laughs> last name to mine and um for a while she, you know i still refer to her her, yeah. her maiden name and she writes it on things and so that's just weird for some people you know you change your last name but to, to really not only change your your identity your gender identity but also your or i should say express your true gender identity i don't know if i'm i don't know forgive me okay. if i use any improper language but um but doing that along with a name change that's a lot to that's a lot. So I, I, I'd love to hear about the, the process of your name choice and, and how that all came together for you. You know, um, part, I guess part of my name journey, um, most people don't know about like Heather does. Uh, I went through probably uh, a half dozen names. Um, you know, even before I was out, uh, but I tried them kind of in secret. Uh, Heather knew of one, uh, the there was one that Heather knew about, um, and that we actually told the kids about. The kids did not like it. <laughs> <laughs> what was their reaction? Were they just like, nope, sorry. Um, they thought I was too old for it. Um, <laughs> I always liked well, the name Zoe, too. and um, you know, but yeah, it didn't feel right, and so, so uh, you know, I January six was my first day in February, that's when I legally changed my name. And <clears throat> so I knew I, I had to kind of, uh, real, you know, kind of going into that Christmas break before coming out. I, well, I'm, okay. I've got to pick a name now. Um, I knew I actually started with my middle name. Um, I knew what I wanted to, my middle name to be middle name is grace. Um, and that's something that, mm. I talk about a lot. Grace has been so important in my life. You know, I, I'm somebody who's kind of come through a very abusive faith world um, and, you know, transition and all this. Um, and I've emerged like with this, for me, a stronger faith. And, you know, a lot of people don't. And, you know, that's, you know, everybody kind of has their own kind of path through all that. Um and so, um, but for me, grace has been so important in my life. So I knew that grace had to be my middle name. I didn't want it to be my first name. Um, so I had to find a first name that fit well with grace. So I just started at the beginning of the alphabet. Um, I had a friend, um, at my first HR job, her name was Anna Grace. Couldn't do love love the name, but I can't take the same name as my friend, and so, um, I just started going down the line, and I got to the end. And I was like Natalie. I'm like, hmm, 
and I wanted a name that could be abbreviated or shortened like Nat. And so um, I'm like, okay, I kind of like that, Natalie Grace. And so um, that's kind of how I picked that name. Um, I wish we could normalize people picking their own names. (laughs) Um, I think it's, you know, like I hated my name, my dead name. Hated it anyways. Always hated it. And some of it may have been the gender dysphoria, but I just never liked it. And um, so uh, um, it was fun to be able to pick my name. Um, one of those things, so this interesting, again, phenomenon amongst trans people is, and you see, especially with trans women, you, you not only see like, when you're going through those phases of life that you missed, you know, I, I transitioned in my mid to late thirties. Well, that means I missed my early twenties. I missed my mid late twenties. I missed all the fun phases of life that, um, you know, so a lot of times, uh, trans women will, when they kind of go through, Go through; they'll still go through these phases, but they just do it later in life when they start transitioning. Um, fortunately for me, like especially when it came to the clothing, I was still on the very secretive part of transition, so I didn't go out in public, you know, wearing things I probably should not have been wearing, and um, or with names. So I, I finally, when I finally socially transitioned, I felt like I had the. I was comfortable wearing clothes and with my name that they were the clothes and name of a 40 year old woman. And so I just felt really comfortable with it. Yeah. yeah, I imagine that's uh, a learning curve right there. That's funny. I can't dress myself. So (laughs) I have a very important question for you. Um, (laughs) Given the fact that my wife retained her maiden name, Mm-hmm. Would you agree that that makes me a better person than Sam? Oh, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> now, Thank you. Uh, there you know, go. We're uh, friends now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Heather, uh, she took my name. And so I'm kind of like in Sam's boat here now. Oh, I think, I'm better than both of you. <laughs> so, and, you know, I think if that period when, um, I think if our kids were younger when I, when I transitioned and legally changed my name, and I think if we had really set and put some thought into it, I wouldn't have been opposed to changing first, middle, last. And yeah. coming, just coming up with our new family name. Um, yeah. You know, but the kids by that point, um, I think, you know, I didn't change it until my son was 14 years old at the time when we legally changed names. We're not going to force him to change his last name. Um, But we've told them like, look, if you ever want to change your name, they're just names, Um, you know, change it. But uh, yeah, Heather and I have talked about like, yeah, we kind of wish we, you know, maybe, maybe in, if we were who we are, if we were in our early twenties, who we are today, I doubt she would have changed her last name. <clears throat> yeah. I, but I, I am curious about like you talked about your time in the military and it, I, I'm wondering, cause it's, it's like, it's a thing that, you know, it's neither Sam or I've served in the military. And sometimes there's like certain subjects. You just get like these whispers of, uh, of, things that are that are happening or going on or that people encounter and stuff obviously you know suicide's a really mm-hmm. prominent thing in in uh in veterans and things like that curious like the amount of different medications that you were prescribed like is that something that you saw on a regular basis like was that going on with a lot of the 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 people that were serving there with you Oh, absolutely. Um, the idea to take all the meds when I first got, when I would get to my unit in the morning, so I would pass out, came from my buddy who was doing the same thing. And he, he was probably like a month ahead of me. And so he was no longer, like they had already told him, just go home. Um, and so he gave me the idea. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, when 
I always kind of, I know when people say, oh, thank you for your service, they, I know they mean well. Um, I, I've started becoming more honest about, I've got very complicated feelings about the military. Um, you know, somebody that my son knew as Uncle Ricky uh, <clears throat> was 26 years old. And when I, was, when I went to basic training, he was in the bunk next to me. Um, we went out to Fort Bragg, uh, for special forces training about the same time. Then we, we were both stationed in Alaska and we deployed together. Then we were in the same unit in every place that I was in the army. My friend Ricky was there with me. Um, and he was the kind of soldier that in combat, nobody that I would rather have than Ricky Elder, um, just, <sighs> great combat soldier. Um, now back in garrison, back in stateside, there is no soldier. I would l least rather, rather I, no soldier. I wouldn't want, or I did not want him as my soldier, uh, constantly getting in trouble, you know, life of the party, but that always got him in trouble back stateside. So, um, uh, but he deployed, I know when we deployed to Iraq together, uh, his truck had gotten blown up and he was up in the hospital in Baghdad, had a major concussion. Uh, when he found out his friend who was the gunner in the truck had died, um, I remember at the Baghdad hospital, they had those windows that had the, the mesh, the wire mesh inside the window. Um, he had. Uh, when he found out his friend, the gunner had died, uh, he punched that window and it broke. Um, you know, so, but the army did what the army does. Um, as long as you can pull your, pull your trigger finger, as long as that trigger finger is functioning, um, they will throw you right back in. So, um, Yeesh. He, uh, you know, he eventually came back down to the unit. He deployed again to Afghanistan, um, uh, after I had gotten out and then in 2012, um, he was 26 years old, married with two kids, um, and was because of the two traumatic, he had another traumatic brain injury in Afghanistan <clears throat> because of the two traumatic brain injuries. Um, the, he, he was told he has early onset dementia. And so <clears throat> because he was also Ricky and always getting in trouble, <clears throat> He, there was a big uh, theft ring going on at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. A lot of like high ranking people kind of went down for this. He had a toolkit, like just one single toolkit um, that was part of this. <clears throat> but because he had so many other run ins with uh, mili uh, you, what we call UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, uh, he was going to get chaptered out and lose all his benefits. So the day he got diagnosed with uh, dementia, he posted on Facebook that, um, you know, kind of his diagnosis and he, it was on a Friday and he went to every Friday, the units do what we call a safety briefing, you know, so they get all the soldiers there and they basically tell them, don't be idiots over the weekend. And um, he uh, got out of formation and went up to the front of the formation and, uh, uh, shot and killed his battalion commander, then uh, shot and took his own life. Um, oh my God. I don't, I've never, and I will never see him as a murderer. Um, this was 26 year old who saw his future um, of being, having dementia and his wife in, uh, in a matter of years, not knowing who his wife and kids are and knowing that they were going to, um, that was just, so that, um, you know, we lost him. And then um, coming up on four years ago, um, one of my really, the actually the first uh, army, got, army buddy I told ever came out to, um, his name was Will, um, genuinely like one of my most favorite people I've ever met. Uh, he uh, just in a lot of pain, um, physical pain, um, you know, struggling with the PTSD and, um, he lived up in Dallas and, uh, he had, uh, a seven-year-old boy 
and a seven week old uh, boy. And um, uh, he, he died by suicide as well. So That's my awful. thoughts on the army is, you know, I wouldn't have the, some of the best people, people that I would trust my children's lives with, without hesitation. Um, I would have never met without the army, but without the army, they'd still be alive. And, um, you know, yeah, you do, you know, even as a pacifist, um, you look back and you're like, oh yeah, you know, we did some really cool stuff like Black Hawk missions in the middle of the night, but you also saw the evil of what we were doing. Um, you know, we had a mission where we, <clears throat> my, my squad was on what they call a support by fire and we were overlooking a house and while another squad raided the house. So, um, you know, we, we hear the sounds and all of a sudden we hear shots being fired and we're like, Oh crap. Usually these go pretty smoothly. And, um, uh, so once they've secured the scene, you know, they bring the support by fire element up. And so we go up and we're on top of the roof, like over in Iraq, you know, especially during the summertime, they sleep up on top of the roof. It's a little bit cooler out there. And there's probably, he may be 14 years old, 14 year old boy laying there dead. And um, now he had woken up in the middle of the night with a U.S. soldier standing over him and a gun pointing in his face. Um, He did what any normal person would have done. He reached up and grabbed it. Um, My buddy um, who like, you know, is a good friend of mine. Um, we're actually, I think, I think we're still friends on Facebook. Um, he, uh, he did what any soldier would have done. Somebody grabs your weapon, you shoot and you, uh, neutralize the threat, so to speak. And, um, I mean, it's what you're, it's what, it's literally what they instill in you. So it's like not even the thought reaction. It's just something that happens. And so, um, I remember, um, my platoon leader is like, Hey, Drew, um, gave me a body bag. I like put the boy, like by this point they had taken the women off the roof. Um, we would always segregate them. And, um, he, uh, like, Hey, can you put the, this kid in the body bag? I'm like, sure. By that point I was so numbed and yeah. so de- the dehumanization that's involved. And so I didn't think anything about it. Um, like, yeah, we'll throw them in there. Um, well then probably like 30 minutes later, we hear the call over the radio we were at the wrong house. Oh my God. You hear about this stuff. Yeah. And I've, just hearing a story like this firsthand, is, it's fucking gut wrenching. And so my platoon leader looked at me. He's like, "Take, we're taking the body bag with us, but not the body. So I, they had me dump the kid out. And um, we give the family basically a receipt. Say, come to our base. We will pay you a lot of money for killing your child. And, um, oh, holy God. shit. Uh, the sound when the, when the women of that family made it back to the top of the roof and they saw it, it's a sound. I will never, I've never heard wailing until that night. Oh my God. I and, can't even... So I have very complicated relation feelings on my time in the army. Um, you know, jumping out of airplanes, so fun. Uh, meeting these amazing guys. I would have never in a million years, if I met them in the civilian world, would have ever associated with. But they became brothers to me. Um, but then we have stuff like that. And so, yeah. yeah. What is kind of what is that everything. transitional? Because, I mean, it, you know, you talk about like the dehumanization that, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a survival mechanism almost like you have to see yeah. the, the other side as, as the enemy and stuff in order to follow through with what you're, you know, you're commanded to do. Like you've got no choice in some ways. And, and I mean, it, it, it sounds like, you know, you eventually reexamined those feelings and, and stuff. And now, you know, especially like watching Iraq degenerate and our position there basically be, torn apart i mean what how, how long did it take you to to process that stuff and arrive at the point where you know you're a pacifist now and and like what are your feelings on i mean i i, I imagine i could kind of i would assume that that the iraq war 
for you is a, is a really painful subject. Um, so the process takes a long time um, because the process of the dehumanization takes a long time because it's not, you know, they have to, it's hard to even say that you viewed them as an enemy because an enemy is still a human. We've, we completely dehumanized them. Um, to us, um, they were no different than a chair. And just like you didn't mind if you broke their chairs, you didn't mind if you killed them. Um, they were, they were just completely, um, subhuman to us. Um, but it's not something that's not something that happened overnight in Iraq. Um, basic training when you, um, we would, especially infantry basic training, um, where there, there were no women around, there were no civilians around. You're in a very isolated part of Fort Benning. Um, I remember, um, we would go to, uh, Every day we like you know march to breakfast chow, and we wherever we march we'd call cadence. You know we had cadences about going onto a school uh, play school playground and chopping children up with a uh, machete, um, gunning people down. Everything you know the one of the you know and most a lot of civilians have heard this one. Um, you know that drill sergeants to say, what makes the green grass grow? And all the soldiers would say, blood, blood, blood makes the green grass grow. Um, it's just non-stop dehumanization of not of the enemy, but of you. And they have to strip down your humanity um, for you to be able to kill other people without conscience. Um, that's why I'm a firm believer I don't care what you see in combat. Everybody who goes um, suffers from PTSD um, because one, your body is pumping out adrenaline nonstop for 13 months. Um, that's going to affect your brain chemistry, but you really have no choice but to like be brutal uh, because at the end of the day, your job is to get you and your buddies home safely Um so, you know, but it, there was a, um, when we had our patrol base and, uh, we had a patrol base that kind of out in the, this farm area and some insurgents, and I hate to call them insurgents. We were in their damn country. Um, some local nationals, um, shot another local national, um, this boy, um, probably about 12 years old. Um, his father brings him to the patrol base. Like, you know, the boy had been shot in the head. Um, we knew the kid was not going to make it. And so, but we brought him into the patrol base and our medic was, you know, he's like, asked for somebody to come over and hold the IV bag. So I ran over there real fast and um, the medic tells me, he's like, I've always wanted to do this. Um, he uh, did a tracheotomy on the kid. Um, yeah, he wanted to practice. And so he does this tracheotomy and I remember I'm sitting there holding and I, this shows how dehumanized you have to become um, and why I believe is so inherently evil. Um, I'm sitting there in awe. I'm like, oh, this is like so freaking cool. And then like he blows in the tube and he had inserted the tube too far. Well, stomach acid came um, out over my friend, our medic's face. And I'm laughing about it. And this is like a 12 year old boy who's like literally dying in front of me. Um, so when you get back and you start processing all these things, um, it's hard. Uh, it's really hard. Um, cause I deployed in 06 and 2006 through 2007. So I still had, uh, several years left in the army before I got out and yeah, my gender dysphoria was a major source of depression. Um, my pain was a major source of, um, you know, the reason I was on pain pills, but, um, yeah, I was on three antidepressants because, you know, I was still dealing with a lot of PTSD yeah. and, oh so really embracing nonviolence really helped a lot of that. Um, you know, not just embracing nonviolence, but um, trying to be an active 
participant in the nonviolence movement. You know, going over to Palestine for two weeks, we had went over there. And by this point, I think this was in 2016, I felt like I had processed all my army baggage. <clears throat> um, but we're over there and we're in the old city of Hebron. And um, the Isra- every Sat- or every other Saturday, the Israeli military will come in, open the gates, and they'll escort um, Israeli settlers through. Um, it's really a show of intimidation, show of force. And um, we got back to the uh, CPT apartment, and I broke down in tears because at some point it hit me like the the disdain and the disgust that I was looking at those soldiers like those soldiers were who I used to be um you know i we i remember uh in iraq the little boy comes up to me probably 8 years old he's like you know it's always like mr mr and they you know they'd want stuff you know and that's fine um i gave him a can of chewing tobacco like because i thought it would be funny and so I, I saw that, um, I saw that the way those soldiers looked at the Palestinian people, it was the way I looked at the Iraqi people and it broke my heart. Like it, that, that I'm a firm believer that any violence wounds the soul. Um, and that wound, like somebody just took a knife and dug into it. And, um, like I broke down when we got back to the apartment. And so, um, I think to some point there is always going to be a lingering area that I haven't fully processed. Um, I've done the EMDR therapy, which was very helpful. Um, but that was really mostly focused on my church trauma, um, and dealing with that childhood stuff. So, um, uh, but I'm, as always processing it. Um, especially as I lose friends, um, you know, can, um, like one thing I've always said is, um, and this is what, why I get so upset when people like call for war, war, the people who fight war, it never ends. Like we will come back, but we will continue to fight that war until the day that we die. And, um, you know, so, um, I know that there's going to be a part of me that's always going to fight that war, uh, that we fought in Iraq because this, it fundamentally changed who I was. Wow. It's, that is unbelievable. I, you're, it must give you hearing your story in the way that you can, because, you know, over here, uh, when you're having political discourse, you can look at what's going on in other countries, whether it's Israeli Palestinian conflict or anything, any turmoil in the Middle East that we probably had a part in that we're maybe just not taking responsibility for. But either way, you can look at all that and you can pick out, okay, the good guys are bad guys. You know, growing up, it's all pro-Israel. But now you kind of look at it from a little bit of a higher view and you're like, well, Palestinians are really being put out. But it, So then you paint Israel in their military and leadership as the, the bad guys. But yeah. hearing your story and the way that you're looking at it and the way that you can say anyone who's fighting for their, anyone who's signing up to fight for their country, unless they're forced to, but a lot of them are doing it for multiple reasons, but mm-hmm. to hear, hearing your ability to like kind of humanize them and feel for the, the perpetrators of violence or in evil or, and know that, you know, that anyone, any, anyone can be, can be brought to that point. I, I, I was, I mean, I think it's your honesty there is, is uh, beautiful. I, I thank and so much for sharing all that. No, you kind of touch on a, a very important point in, you know, anybody can kind of be pushed to that point, you know, the, the little things, you know, um, and it's so, this is what I think so nefarious about it. Um, the military understands what it takes. There, there is an element of brainwashing involved. That's why from day one of basic training, it is what makes the green grass grow. Blood, blood, blood makes the green grass grow. Um, you know, when you talk of when every it's a culture of death. And when you when you immerse somebody in that culture of death, um, you know, doesn't matter how justified we believe that we are. Like I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. Um and uh do, my favorite doctor, Peter Capaldi, number twelve, um, he uh, has a great anti war speech. Um and it's honestly, the, when I first, when I was watching it and we first saw it, I literally almost stood up and started clapping 
because it's an irrefutable speech. And he talks about, you know, to paraphrase, um, once that first shot is fired, once that first bomb is dropped, um, we don't know what children are going to be orphaned, what wives will be screaming. You know, the, the, we don't know who the victims are going to be of this. Um, and then eventually we're going to get to the point where we should have started from the beginning and we're going to have to sit down and talk. Um, and it's just such this, this such beautiful uh, case for like every war that has, ever, you know, they end unless you completely annihilate the other people. Um, there comes a point where you had to sit down across a table and talk to each other. And um, so, you know, I, I see this beautiful Kate, this beautiful anti-war speech, but you see how, you know, it makes so much sense, but then you see how easy it is to kind of, uh, to really brainwash what I believe are genuinely good people. I have no judgment with veterans. Um, I am a veteran. I love my brothers that I served with. Um, you know, I actually, I, last week or the week before I, um, one of them lives about an hour North of here and we got together first time. Um, he's obviously seen me since I transitioned and, um, we hadn't seen each other since 2008 and it's like no time had passed. Um, it's, you know, they're genuinely good people, but the system is rotten to its yeah. core. Um, it is evil at its core. And, um, it's so, uh, seeing how many people and how easy it is, you know, it's made me kind of reflect on, you know, like the question, like, well, what would you do if you lived in 1930s Germany? Mm -hmm. It's easy for us to say, oh, I would have not done this. I wouldn't have done been part of that. But it's that, you know, my I remember before I deployed, uh, we had found um, a book that my was it my I think it was my my mom's side, I think it was my great, my great grandfather. He fought in world war two and they were all given kind of like this intro to the Japanese type of book to, you know, um, and you read it and you're like, this is such racist garbage. Um, but it's all part of that laying that groundwork for that dehumanization yeah. where these are good people, but you know, um, anybody can kind of be taken in by this. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a hundred percent true. And I feel like that, that dehumanization is something that, you know, it's, it, I think it's easy for a lot of people to point at like some of the stuff that you're talking about and say like, that's dehumanization, but like, we all kind of do it on mm -hmm. lesser scales. And, um, you know, you see it all the time where, it's just so easy to believe that like we're a different class of human than those people over there, whether you're looking backwards or side to side, it's really easy to look and be like, ah, well, these are scumbag people that, you know, obviously they were morally inferior to, uh, but I think you make a powerful point in that, like put into a given situation, the vast majority of us, are going to go along with the crowd in a, in a lot of cases, you know, you always hope that you wouldn't, but the, the fact is, is that we always have to some extent. And so like having some empathy towards people who, who think differently or that, that have, um, you know, ascribe beliefs and stuff that are different than yours. I mean, you can't lose sight of that because to lose sight of it is to, is to lie to yourself about who you are. And we see so much of that today in our political culture, um, that the other, um, it's no longer Joe next door. I just, I disagree with Joe and his views of, you know, social welf welfare programs. It's not that it's my neighbor is a, you know, scumbag Marxist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like we, instantly people and then you'll also see people are also it feels like they're more heavily gravitating towards um and that's the increasing polarization, but in, gravitating towards more extreme 
narrations of these things. So like, you know, you're not, not to say that there's plenty of people who are still kind of like, you know, center left, center right, whatever, kind of like right in the middle, but we are seeing the growing. So it's like, now it's like, okay, now you got to have the let's go Brandon flag, the Trump flag, <sighs> the, and you got to have it all. And that's like, now that's what it means to be a Republican as opposed yeah. to, and of course you can see that on, I'm, I'll, I'm not, I'm not exactly a Democrat either, and I don't really I had to <laughs> take a whole political rant here, but you can see the extreme. Marxist. Yeah, you can see the extreme <laughs> on the other side in the way that they, they'll just default to whatever the, the default position is and then wrap all that into their identity. And it's it's because it's clean. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's clean a, a and it's point. easy to think of things along those those boundaries, you know, but in fact, like the people that that you know, you're sneering at like a lot of them love their kids and they're, yep. they're good parents and good brothers and good husbands and wives and, and all of that stuff. And to discount them because of one thing or, or a set of beliefs or whatever is to really sell them and you short. And, you know, and it's something I'm certain I know I'm guilty of. Cause um, I've said before, it is so hard for me to show grace to the people that, are the way I used to be. Um, <laughs> or, you know, um, I struggle with uh, TERFs, the trans exclusionary radical feminists, really struggle with remembering that they're human beings. Um, from my faith, they're created in the image of God. And I forget that sometimes. And um, I, or the, the Theo bro culture on Twitter, um, you know, so I, I joke, I'm like, oh, yay, you know, I, I almost like a badge of honor. I'm uh, blocked by like the Denny Burks or the Owen Strakens. But when in reality, that shouldn't break my heart because that's communication that's been shut off. And mm -hmm. that's 100%. the other side that I'm not going to be able to reach because um, for whatever reason, you know, I, well, I I don't know if I was necessarily a jackass to him, um, but you know I pushing and pushing um, on a specific point, and so knowing um, you know we can all so easily fall back into that, um, and so yeah, absolutely. Hey, can what you they... tell me real quick? You mentioned earlier that you were an anarchist. Mm -hmm. Can you can you explain what that? Because that's a broad term that I think everybody <laughs> has like a different idea in their head about yes. what that means. What does it mean to you? <clears throat> Okay, so I'm glad you asked this question um, because you're right. There is, I think there are a lot of misconceptions on what anarchism is. Um, for me, I am an anarchist because I am a pacifist. Um, to me, you cannot separate the state from violence. Every law is something, it is an edict that is backed through the threat of violence from the state. You break this rule. We will send people uh, with guns to enforce that rule or to punish you for it. So, um, I I don't agree with the you know existence of the state. Um, and from a faith perspective, um, you know I look at you know First Samuel eight when the Israelites ask for a king and Elijah's like you know or Sam I'm sorry Samuel is just like oh they're rejecting me and God's like no no no. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But you know what? If they want a king, we'll let them have one. Um, but just tell them that this is what's going to happen if they have this. So um, I do believe that there is a faith perspective. But at the end of the day, I am, a, I am an anarchist because I am a pacifist. And I abhor the violence of the state. Um, you know, it's... I don't seek to overthrow the state because to seek to overthrow the state would require the use of violence. Um, <laughs> I just like the way my wife and I approach it, we do and we live in a way that we believe is in accordance with our faith. Um, if it puts us at odds with the state, so be it. We will accept that, um, you know, uh, in terms of like, say, Romans 13, which always gets thrown in my face. To me, what that's saying is, uh, yes, I break the rule um, because I'm doing something that, you know, I know there a few years ago, there was a big controversy. I know in Houston, we had this problem. Um, people going out to feed the homeless um, and uh, 
get them getting shut right. down, threatened with the rest because um, they didn't have the proper food license. You know, to me as a Christian anarchist, do that. And if you get arrested, so be it. it submit to that punishment. Um, go ahead and take it. Um, that's the worst that they're going to be able to do to you. Um, but I don't seek to try to overthrow the state. I don't participate in the state. I, I, you know, I have, this is not something I'm very vocal about. I don't vote because to me, voting means that I am saying, I am trying to give authority to a person to use the threat of violence over my neighbor. And so I just don't, I don't participate. Um, you know, is it idealistic or not feasible? I don't know. Um, it's just, that's kind of where I am. Um, you know, I think abortion is a great example. This is, uh, you know, I find myself at odds with so many of people of my kind of, I guess, Christian camp. I call myself pro-life. That said, I don't support a ban on abortion. Um, because I think a ban on abortion, again, requires the use of violence to enforce it. I don't believe that's the most effective way of addressing the problem. I think the problem we, I think politics causes us to reduce everything down to this very simplistic A versus B, um, black versus white, when it's not like that. I know Absolutely. people who love God dearly um, and they are truly amazing human beings and they have had abortions and I, who am I to sit here and judge the situations that they were in, in life um, much less who am I to sit here and want say they need to be thrown into a cage because they were in a situation that I cannot even begin to comprehend um, because I've been in situations that other people can't comprehend. And I did some pretty evil things, um, you know, and not necessarily just for my self-preservation, but because I had been completely dehumanized. Um, so I don't support laws against abortion um, because I just, I don't, th I just don't think the government's the best way of, I don't think the government's the best way of addressing any issue. Um, you know, that said, um, if the government's going to do something, at least let them do something moral. Like, yes, if you're going to spend money, how about let's not spend $800 billion on defense spending and let's spend $800 billion. If you, if you insist on spending $800 billion, let's spend it on building homes for the houseless, feeding the houseless, um, you know, Let's address real problems, not the enemies that we keep creating. I, I feel like well, you're forgetting something, though. Um, freedom ain't free. Yeah. <laughs> so what about that? It costs a buck oh five. You have uh, you have my vote, Nat. I, I won't I won't cast it for you in solidarity with your ethos, but I nah. right here you have it. Yeah. <laughs> now, now the voting thing to me, I. I, I, I'm I, every election, my wife and I sit there in awe and we continue to look at the people that are trotted out for the masses to choose from. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're dumbfounded why there aren't more anarchists. Um, because if I, I am a firm believer that we need to one, get rid of the vote because one, I think it's a useless, it's a, it's, I, I just don't find it useful because look who we keep ending up with. Um, and just, you know what? Screw it. Let's go to a national lottery. We draw your social security <laughs> number. You are president for the next year. <laughs> and do that with every, le like, it cannot be worse than what we currently have. I um, probably can't. That's so funny. Like, 2016 through 2020 kind of should have woken everybody up. Yeah, I would have. Love to see people wake up a little bit more, but that before I don't, I, do you have a little bit more time? Uh, I want to finish with, um, you know, touching on your faith because I don't know if you've noticed, uh, over the number of years, but Christianity isn't always the most welcoming place for trans people. Uh, so I, it's interesting how that's worked for you. It's, uh, you know, for I'm assuming you found a, a wonderful community that's that accepts you, but I, I, 
has that been a challenge, you know? Um, and of course, you know, dealing with people and their, their quippy little clobber passages yeah. and things like that. I, 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 I'd, I'd like to hear what your faith experience has been since, since transitioning and, um, it, yeah. And it just your overall kind of experience, I guess. So, um, this has been interesting because when I came out, um, I love Twitter to me, Twitter's the greatest of the social media platforms. Um, you know, I came out and I expected, like, I think I had like 200 followers at the time and as a very niche, um, uh, Christian anarchist kind of group that I was very close to. Um, I expected to lose like, like, okay, here's my public post to come out to like 200 people. And I, I, I was just like, okay, all those followers are going to go away, which I don't care about follower account. But, you know, I was like, I expected to lose that community that I had. <clears throat> um, strangely, um, it's been the exact opposite. Uh, you know, I um, have just been flooded with so- the weird Christian Twitter community. <laughs> has been this amazing life-giving um, group. I know that everybody there is not affirming, but I have had so many people in that kind of community who have reached out and told, like, you know, when I drove up to Michigan, uh, moving up here from Texas uh, back in November, you know, I stopped um, stopped in Paducah and stayed with a, a really close friend of mine uh, who I knew through Twitter. Then I went through Indianapolis um, and I had lunch with um, somebody, you know, a friend of mine from Twitter uh, up in Indianapolis. And we were talking and I've heard this so many times. I'm the first trans person that most of that, a lot of these people have ever really interacted with. Um which kind of goes along with uh, there's a great documentary on Netflix called Disclosure. um, And it talks, and it's all about the depiction of trans people historically within Hollywood um, and the harmful effects that it's had and how it's kind of getting better. But one thing they talked about was 80% of Americans know at least one gay or lesbian person, but only 20% of Americans actually know a transgender person. So, That's what makes how Hollywood has historically depicted trans people, specifically trans women, um, you know, sex workers or uh, sexual deviants. Um, A lot of people's perception of trans people has come from those depictions. So for I've had a lot of people kind of in this community, this weird Christian Twitter community who have reached out and told me that, you know, I'm the first trans person they've known and the impact that that's had on them and their understanding um, of trans people and their acceptance of trans people. Um, So just flooded with this outpouring of love. And now it hasn't all been weird Christian Twitter people that, you know, I was talking, I actually, I went to, drove to Toledo, the Toledo area last weekend uh, to have dinner or to spend the weekend with my brother and his family. And on the way I stopped and had dinner with a friend of mine who I knew from Twitter. And, um, you know, I was telling her, I was like, it's weird. I've got this wonderful eclectic kind of group of people that I interact with, you know, Christians, pastors, um, women with OnlyFans accounts, you know, this wide spectrum of people that I've gotten to know. Um, so that from the, but from the faith perspective, um, I've had no, so, I don't want to say nothing, but so much love and support, um, on social media. And even from our old church, um, when I came out, you know, I had told our pastor and our retired pastor, um, right before I, I think right before we moved to college station, uh, back in 2018 that I was transgender and they were nothing but, you know, they wrapped their arms, around, like both of them, were like, we don't really understand, but we love you. Um, so I, I've gotten a lot of response like that. And that's beautiful. I love that. That said, <laughs> I've also gotten a tremendous amount of hatred. Um, the uh, Denny Burks, the Tom Bucks, the Nathaniel Jollies, these people who, um, you know, that that they just 
It's nothing but condemnation. Um, Alvin is scum. Yes. <laughs> now I will say one of my closest friends on Twitter, Calvinist, love him to death. Um, but uh, he's one of the good ones. Um, <laughs> but yes, most of have this, these Reformed Baptist, Theo Bro type of culture, um, where it's nothing but condemnation. And it used to get to me. Um, it doesn't anymore because I'm like, look, you, um, <clears throat> if, if my faith was dependent on Christians, I would have left the faith a long ass time ago. Um, my, <laughs> I've been able to kind of, you know, reach that point where I'm like, look, I know Christians suck. <laughs> like Christians can really suck. And, um, I'm related to a lot of them. <laughs> But um, uh, I know, my, I truly believe that as much as Christians can be horrible, um, believe like at the from the bottom of my heart that Jesus is pretty freaking awesome, and so I cling to that. Um, you know, so these gatekeepers who you know I'm dealing with them tonight. Um, right before we started this, the. Uh, one of them, Nathaniel Jolly, telling me to repent. Like I'm not a Christian. I'm like, okay, what, whatever. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, you sound like the older brother <laughs> in the prodigal son story. Like, yeah. you're, it's, it's you're really, yeah, like you're going to be really pissed off when I show up to the feast. But guess what? I'm still there, um, and I will look fabulous. But um, uh, so I I deal with the hatred of people like that, um, and. Probably the most infuriating thing is I I could respect it if they were just honest and said, yeah, we hate people like you. But when they <laughs> try to couch it like, oh, no, it's truth in love. I'm speaking <laughs> truth in love. Bullshit. And I'm sorry, yeah. but that's bullshit. You're because what you're not what you're saying is not truth. It's opinion. And it's certainly not loving, um, you know, so. um but by and large, the response that I have gotten from, um, you know, people within my faith tradition has been great. Um, you know, I've blocked so many, you know, and it's probably, I've probably insulated myself from it, from just blocking people. And so uh, there are times I'm just like, you know what, don't care. You like to tweet, I'm blocking you because I don't have, I don't, I don't invite, um, I refuse to invite toxicity or I try to refuse to invite toxicity into my life. That's something that the transition has taught us. Heather as well. Um, it's why we've lost so many family members. Um, you know, cousins, um, aunts, uncles. Um, I've lost a brother over all this. Um, I just, oh, I ref Lord. I'm not, I don't have the time or the energy to like, you want to carry that toxicity in a baggage? That's fine. I love you, but that's yours to carry. You're not going to make me carry your baggage. And um, so that's really losing the number of people that we have within our family that we thought truly loved us um, uh, has really helped in dealing with the people that we don't even know. Like, okay, yeah, some complete stranger wants to condemn me to hell, whatever. Um, I don't, you're not somebody that, you know, you know, I had that familial love with, um, so it's, it's, it doesn't hit me the way that Heather losing her aunt, Heather's actually lost more family than I have. Um, and, um, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's Christians have been great. Um, you know, but I've got this overlap of, you know, um, there's a lot of ex evangelicals in that mix as well who probably don't necessarily identify as christian anymore but they've been nothing but loving and supporting um and at the end of the day christian not christian yeah you know, are you going to treat people with love and respect and um you know that's the people i choose to uh i to social to interact with yeah it, some would argue that that's essentially what it is to be Christian anyway. So if that's what you're getting from people and what you're putting out, I think yeah. that that's great, man. I, Nat, I, we've had you here for a little while. I really, uh, 
you've definitely put a given us a good bit to think about. A lot of stories, um, play, going places I didn't expect to. Uh, so it was a trip. <laughs> Oh, no. Thank y'all so much. I truly, like, my wife will tell you, I will jump at any chance to talk about myself, um, apparently. <laughs> you um, should become a podcaster, then. Yeah. It's like, that's, that's, um, <laughs> yeah, her and I are actually, we're going to try uh, to work on a book. I, like, you know, cause we have a, pe- a lot of people telling us, oh, you need to write a book. You need to write a book. Um, so we're going to try. Um, hopefully that's something that uh, we can kind of pitch and put together. Um Because as we see more and more, this is becoming something that more and more families are being impacted by transition. Um, And you, I just, I wish people would understand you don't have to lose one. You don't have to lose your faith, but you don't have to lose your marriage. You don't have to lose your relationships. Um, For every family member that we've lost, we've gained a hundred people through social media who I consider true family. Um, it's helped me redefine family. And that's what's been really helpful. Um, it's no longer a blood biological connection. It's who are the people who are going to love you through the shitty part of your life. And so, um, you know, uh, so yeah. Um, you know, but thank y'all so much for having me on. I know I get long winded. No, this was great. I was, I, you had me hooked the whole time. Uh, I, that's why we weren't interrupting and trying to redirect. It's like you, there's, it was a fascinating conversation. I was definitely hanging on. Where, where can uh, people I, find yeah. you? What's that? Where can people find you online and stuff? Um, so, uh, I am on Twitter at Nat, N A T G R A C E seven, nine. So at Nat gray 79, um, I have a blog. Um, it's on Wix site, W I X S I T E, uh, finding Natalie. It's a, I didn't pay to have the nice short, um, uh, website address. So it's a very long one. So if you just typed in Wix site and finding Natalie, but I haven't blogged for a little bit. Um, I'm always on Twitter. So Nat gray 79, that's where people can find me. Um, I, I'm on Twitter way too much probably. And, um, and I think it's the same username on Instagram, but, um, that's really just for pictures. And so, um, and I'm never on Facebook. That's the, yeah, whole hellscape. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole hellscape I want nothing to do with. Yeah. And so, cool. but, uh, but no, thank y'all so much. Yeah. Thank you, dad. This is so much fun. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time. Thank you.